Hello friends, these days we are talking about uh, you know sources, characterization, health impacts of the air pollutants which are in the indoor environment. So, today in this series we will discuss about assessment of exposure to indoor air pollutants. Okay. The contents of today's lecture is like uh, general aspects we will discuss in uh, the beginning about the exposure assessment. Then uh, how does sampling uh, you know is done in the indoor environment, what are the principles of the sampling, how to design the sampling that we will see. Then active and passive samplers, the difference between active and passive samplers we will go through. Then assessment of exposure to different indoor air pollutants like nitrogen dioxide or VOCs that is volatile organic compounds or formaldehyde, carbon monoxide, radon, particulate matter, asbestos. Okay, second hand smoke, pesticides, bacteria and fungi, dust mites, all these indoor air pollutants which are very you know important uh, with respect to the human health exposure and uh, deterioration of indoor air quality. We will discuss about how to assess the concentrations of these particular pollutants in the indoor environment. And the monitoring of uh, vent ventilation rates is important because whatever sources are there within uh, the indoor environment or something is coming from outdoor also because of you know door opening, windows etcetera. So, the ventilation plays very critical role to decide how much air quality is deteriorated or improved. So, the monitoring of ventilation rates we will discuss about then temperature measuring devices and measurement of relative humidity because temperature and relative humidity also plays role in deciding about uh, or determining of the indoor air quality. So, that we will discuss and later on we will conclude. So, uh, if we talk about uh, you know the general aspects of exposure assessment then uh, we focus on reasons for assessment of exposure, why do we go for that basically. So, you know some sources based on some sources we can say that uh, you know these uh, surveys are initiated because of problems uh, perceived by the uh, exposed individual. So, if somebody is complaining then we conduct some survey in the particular uh, you know indoor environment offices or in buildings etcetera. And because of you know research interest also related to specific pollutants or health outcomes of that particular situation of pollutant researchers also go for these uh, exposure assessment related studies. The most common reasons are investigations of sick buildings. Okay. You might have heard sick building syndrome which sometimes we talk about because of their indoor environment and people you know frequently fall sick in those buildings because of certain reasons. So, those sick building related issues or disease outbreaks in particular indoor environments, identification of health risks and epidemiological exposure assessment. So, uh, for uh, these kind of investigations or studies we need to go for exposure assessment. Well, then you know these building investigations related aspects are because the control compliance with existing guidelines because there are guidelines okay, or uh, recommendations for non pollutants or to identify the sources of these pollutants. Although there are no well defined guidelines uh, as we have for ambient air quality, but still there are some recommendations based on some research and uh, from WHO and other uh, you know organizations they give some uh, recommendations. So, for those kind of comparisons we want to study those. Diseases outbreaks as we have you know discussed like uh, there are uh, these are kind initiated by the observation of an unusual increase in the uh, incidences of a particular disease in that particular environment and uh, the causal factors if it is not, not, not known then we need to study it okay, in the within the indoor environment and population. Uh, or uh, uh, you know environment investigations are also important factors. These address exposure to a specific pollutant under a specific circumstances in a predefined population because sometimes complaints come that a particular segment of population is affected uh, by certain disease which are related to indoor environment. So, we have to see whether that particular segment of population is living in a particular indoor environment which is highly polluted. right? 
Then when we talk about exposure assessment in epidemiologic, epidemiological studies, it is part of investigations of the relationship between indoor or outdoor airborne environmental exposure and health effects. So, you know series of studies are conducted for several years then we uh, derive some conclusions. And the overall goal of all these investigations is to improve understanding of the exposure and its health effects in the indoor environment uh, terminology. Management of the exposure should not be limited to avoiding toxic or otherwise harmful factors. We have to go for overall management of the indoor air quality basically. So, it should include improving the overall quality of the indoor air which will improve the comfort of the occupants and their quality of life, their health. Okay? So, that will be improved and people will live the healthy life. Then we talk about like sampling designs, how to design the you know sampling. So, it depends upon the population size. So, sample size is also dependent on population size. There are certain statistical ways also to go for uh, how much, uh, how many sample uh, population should go for uh, you know observations for uh, assessment or uh, for evaluation. Okay, simple random sampling is done or uh, with the help of certain you know systematic uh, uh, methodologies are also done. Like stratified random sampling can be there or systematic sampling can be there or cluster sampling can be there. So, depending upon the situation we can go for either of these kind of sampling strategies. Well, when we talk about samplers, so there are two major kind of samplers like active samplers or passive samplers. Active sampling requires the use of uh, you know pumping device to actively pass air through uh, an air sample uh, container whereas passive sampling does not passive sampling is like something you have uh, you know uh, pasted at the uh, particular wall or uh, you know at a hanging kind of uh, situation it is there and uh, something like it is getting exposed to air so some gas will be absorbed some particles will be there or something like that so the passive sampling re really relies on the kinetic energy of the gas molecules and diffusion uh, of the gases in an enclosed space uh, onto a uh, this absorbent medium okay absorption adsorption those kind of thing whereas active samplers need uh, some type of pump when we you know suck the air and then it will pass through uh, certain solutions or on the filter paper so those kind of are the active samplers so active samplers requires some source of power okay like electric or battery related or energy for their operation whereas passive samplers are not dependent on any source of power supply so depending upon you know situations we can also go for active and passive sampling plus uh, you know active samplers for short uh, exposure active samplers are important whereas passive samplers are good for long term kind of exposure assessment then there is like uh, you know like uh, assessment of exposure to nitrogen dioxide if you want to do then there are direct approaches and indirect approaches. In direct approaches basically the steady subjects carry a monitor for a certain period to determine exposure. Okay, it may be uh, you know personal sampler kind of thing. So, the monitor can function either actively or passively, but it should be uh, with the uh, you know that person which, who is exposed. Most active samplers collect uh, these oxides of uh, nitrogen over periods of several hours and these monitors are expensive, difficult to calibrate, are subject to drift over time and may respond positively or negatively to several forms of interferences. So, these are you know kind of uh, limitations or challenges in, in case of these direct approaches. Okay. Then consequently uh, most uh, studies directly determining exposure to NO2 that is the nitrogen dioxide have used passive samplers which provide average concentrations over a longer period of several days to one week or more even months. Right? Then the tube type samplers are uh, low sensitivity samplers suitable for long term monitoring whereas the batch type samplers are you know kind of uh, they have faster sampling rates and they are suited to short term kind of monitoring. Well, when we talk about the indirect approach then basically we can go uh, through uh, like a questionnaire based uh, you know surveys. So, that it can be filled by uh, study subjects or an uh, interviewer. Uh, for example, like we have questions, those questions would relate to uh, the presence or absence of one or more of the indoor NO2 sources mentioned above and uh, uh, the frequency and uh, this intensity of their use. 
The next step would be to assess exposure to NO2 by measuring its concentration in the air of all micro environments visited by the population that is under study or of the interest of the researchers or policy makers and by obtaining uh, these information on patterns of human activity. So, that we can correlate with them. Then when we talk about ex assessment of exposure to volatile organic compounds, so again we go for direct approach like VOCs can be sampled by passive personal uh, tubes or badges containing solid uh, adsorbents mostly uh, tenax. But uh, this uh, there are certain other chemicals uh, which are evacuated the canisters can be used and charcoal or multi adsorbent media have also been used for this purpose. Passive samplers cannot be used for short term sampling as you know we have discussed because of their very low sampling rates. So, they do not represent the you know surrounding concentrations of VOCs and the active samplers must be applied for short exposure period. When we go for indirect approach to assess the exposure of VOCs, then basically this indirect, uh, this indirect exposure monitoring is based on a combination of micro environmental concentration data and personal time like activity data, time and activity kind of variation. Then monitoring of VOC concentrations in micro environments can be easier than monitoring personal exposure directly. So, this is very important point. Some micro environmental studies have also used passive samplers a technique applied particularly in the United States is grab or uh, you know whole air sampling those kind of techniques have also been used. Well, when we talk about formaldehyde related assessment uh, of the exposure of the formaldehyde assessment then direct methods of measuring personal exposure to formaldehyde have been used widely to uh, occupational settings, but not uh, non, non industrial environments. A number of sampling methods uh, you know that use pumps to draw air through these uh, impingers or uh, solid uh, solvents uh, are applied, but the equipment can be uh, basically cumbersome very complex kind of thing. So, sometimes we avoid these kind of methodologies. The diffusive uh, and uh, pumped methods with a solid uh, adsorbent collection medium or collecting medium containing uh, uh, you know uh, those uh, required chemicals are being increasingly used for direct and indirect measurement of personal exposure in this uh, particular uh, for this particular exposure. The sampling duration is important because of the documented temporal uh, variation in concentration of the formaldehyde and the possibility that certain activities such as the use of a product could be carried out over a short period, but cause significant exposure uh, you know uh, because of you know that relationship of the user and the emissions of uh, formaldehyde from that particular product. By contrast use of occasional short term measurements may not provide a representative measure of an occupant's exposure and this may be uh, you know of special interest in the study of chronic health effects. So, you know short term impacts of acute uh, concentration or long term impact of uh, you know very low concentration uh, both things are to be seen and uh, differentiation has to be uh, made properly. When we talk about assessment of exposure to carbon monoxide, we have several times discussed its health impacts as you know, then the personal or micro environmental CO levels can be uh, you know continuously monitored by lightweight personal exposure monitoring uh, methods based on uh, electrochemical cells. The size and weight of personal CO monitors have been uh, reduced to those uh, of a portable uh, uh, you know cassette player and the operating time increased to months. So, that it is easy to uh, you know use for a longer period and the passive CO sampling tubes have also been developed and tested. So, active and uh, passive both kind of sampling strategies are available for CO exposure assessment also. The CO passive sampler is based on the principle of the diffusion of CO molecules onto the absorbing medium okay. and uh, the formed uh, metallic uh, you know palladium can then uh, this uh, photo metrically be determined by a specific reaction uh, in the laboratory. The sampler is composed of a uh, you know this uh, 
particular uh, housing uh, related uh, that uh, case is there with an opening of 20 mm in diameter to exclude wind and weather related disturbances a glass fiber supported by a wire net is also attached and set up in a protective shelter so that uh, those weather and uh, uh, you know air related disturbances are not there well when we talk about the exposure to radon then the most frequent methods of exposure assessment of this particular chemical uh, is indirect basically and the radon concentration is uh, monitored in various indoor space and uh, information uh, on activity patterns is uh, collected using the questionnaire based surveys. Several biomarkers are also there of exposure to radon. It can be measured including the presence of uh, like radon progeny in bones or teeth, blood and hair. So, those kind of ways are also there to measure the radon exposure. Well, here you can see the sample collection and the analytical methods for determining or detecting radon in environment layer samplers. So, this table gives the sampling preparations, analytical methods and exposure time and the sample detection limit for this particular different kind of methodologies. Well, uh, personal uh, radon monitors have been developed using an alpha particle track film, uh, you know this collection of uh, radon uh, uh, progeny inside the monitor is enhanced by an electrode that uh, covers the film and a screening aimed at uh, detecting high risk buildings attempts to maximize radon readings by collecting samplers over 3 to 7 days to overcome any diurnal variation. Diurnal variation means in daytime it varies from uh, you know morning to evening because of several regions. Uh, some uh, you know these uh, situational regions are also there, temperature, humidity also play a role and the sampling should be carried out for radon exposure assessment at the lowest point in the building because that is the uh, you know the place where lot of concentration occurs because it emits in those uh, places which are at the like uh, uh, you can see kind of uh, uh, like basement areas where uh, lot of emissions can be there. Okay, then when we talk about uh, you know particulate matter related exposure assessment, then uh, currently measured using uh, particle mass, uh, particle mass and particle number and particle size distribution. All three matrices are measured nowadays. Several instruments are av available, and these particulate mass is measured using gravimetric methods and uh, beta attenuation methods also. Then particle number concentration is measured by uh, condensation particle counters, okay. optical particle counters are also there and diffusion charges, uh, charger based uh, instruments are also there. When we talk about particle size distribution, they are measured by gravimetric impactors, aerodynamic particle sizers and fast mobility particle sizers. So, these are different uh, you know methodologies for these three important mass, size and number okay, of the particles. Then uh, low cost uh, sensor networks are also available uh, to uh, you know monitor uh, for uh, these kind of particulate matter related observations and they look promising as the solution to measuring uh, special distribution of particulate matter indoors. However, there are important sensor or data quality technological barriers which are challenges to address with this technology. So, we have to keep that mind keep in, in the mind. An improved uh, understanding of epidemiology is essential to identify which uh, matrices uh, correlate most with uh, health effects and allowing indoor specific particulate matter standards to be developed and to inform the future experimental applications. So, that is also very important aspects for particulate matter exposure assessment. When we talk about asbestos related exposure assessment, so basically you know these human lung samples uh, biopsy material may be uh, you know plasma ash or uh, alkali, al alkali digested and the resulting inorganic materials can be examined by light or electron uh, microscopy coupled with elemental analysis of individual fibers. So, th th that is the uh, important technique for that particular exposure. This enables long term exposure to persist fibers and uh, that persisting fibers and short term exposure to less persistent mineral fibers or man made uh, you know uh, these fibers to be quantified. So, differentiation can be uh, estimated. Well, uh, the environmental uh, you know concentration of the fibers is estimated by filtering air through membrane filters followed by light or electron microscopic examination of those filters. 
at a low concentration filtering uh, large volumes of air can lead to small fiber numbers that is uh, you know we be careful about which are uh, you know overwhelmed by the large amount of uh, these uh, non fibrous particulate matter likely to be found on the fibers. So, the results can be affected accordingly. The fiber content is uh, settled dust has been used as an indicator uh, this does identify the sources of exposure but only provide a crude indication of quantitative exposure. So, those are the things which are important in that uh, particular exposure assessment. Well, when we talk about exposure assessment of second hand smoke, then personal monitoring can be there, biomarkers can also be used for assessment purpose. When we talk about personal monitoring, these you know portable monitors can be used for sampling particulate matter which could be of size PM 2.5 or PM 10 and uh, as a non specific indicator of exposure to environmental tobacco smoke basically for that size uh, uh, you know uh, span you can see. Biomarkers like uh, nicotine and uh, these cotinine in this saliva blood and urine are widely used biomarkers of uh, recent that is within 24 hours exposure and here nicotine is a promising new biomarker for assessing exposure lasting several months. So, these are also developing biomarkers for assessment of exposure assessment to the second hand smoke even if people are not smoking they can get second hand smoking kind of exposure. Well, stationary monitoring can also be done like both active and passive methods are available. So, air sampling pumps have been uh, developed to collect air for the assessment of uh, concentrations of nicotine and uh, these respirable suspended particulate matter SPM that is PM 10 basically. Then uh, nicotine can be collected on a glass fiber uh, you know backup uh, filter treated with sodium uh, this bisulphate and analyzed by gas chromatography okay, with uh, a flame ionization detector. Samples of respirable suspended particulate matter RSPM can be collected on uh, these uh, you know telephone uh, kind of filters. Well, uh, then there are questionnaire based information which is also important in this particular assessment of exposure to the second hand smoke because relevant information on exposure to environmental tobacco smoke includes the amount of cigarettes or other tobacco smoke uh, uh, you know indoors and the location where the smoking occurs, the volume of the space and the type and performance of the buildings ventilation systems all these variables can also affect or influence the exposure of the second hand smoke. The reported levels of environmental tobacco smoke exposure were highly correlated with the measured indoor concentrations of PM 2.5 and PM 10. So, these uh, need to be uh, properly recorded. Well, uh, you know when we talk about assessment of exposure to pesticides, so the personal exposure to pesticides can be assessed by personal air monitors and by uh, measuring the concentration of pesticides on their metabolites in the blood and urine. Then questionnaire information should also be there for obtaining to identify other routes of the exposure such as you know dermal that is through skin, dermal contacts with pesticides or direct methods of uh, measuring dermal exposure are amplified these applied in the occupational settings. Well, when we talk about you know biological monitoring of the pesticides uh, assessment then biological monitoring of pesticides varies with the substance of the interest. In some cases these substances itself is measured and the other cases these metabolites or changes in the uh, these uh, you know uh, different kind of uh, these uh, chemical levels related to the pesticides uh, they are also measured and then it is related. Pesticides and metabolites are analyzed in biological tissues using gas chromatography coupled with electron capture detection and the flame photometric detection or flame ionization detection or mass spectroscopy. So, these kind of technologies methodologies has to be uh, you know available otherwise it is difficult to assess the exposure of pesticides. Well, when we talk about exposure assessment of uh, you know bacteria and fungi then uh, for this particular uh, you know assessment uh, uh, in, a, in, in the indoor environment uh, we can test like uh, air samplers we can use such as impactors or uh, these 
uh, impingers or with sampling directly or a filter or on microscopic slide because uh, they are they also behave like particulate matter you can say they can be collected on filters. Then the fungal mass can be determined through uh, you know this uh, ergosterol concentration and the mass of uh, mass of gram uh, negative bacteria. Well, uh, uh, you know different characteristics related to these kind of uh, uh, pollutants uh, has to be uh, related to different kind of groups of the microbes and that correlation has to be established. When uh, you know we talk about microbial measurement of indoor air includes assessing concentration and identifying the microbes, the, the particular types of the microbes you can see. Then indirect assessment of bioaerosol exposure can also be done such as home surveys for uh, you know these moisture or mold it may also be used to obtain exposure indicators. If this is there then certainly there are chances of the exposure. For personal exposure assessment fungus specific uh, you know these uh, kind of antibodies may be determined in uh, uh, these uh, serum samples by using enzyme leaked uh, these uh, immunosorbent assay that is ELI assay these kind of you know techniques are there which can be used for assessment of exposure to bacteria and fungi. Well, when we talk about exposure to the dust mites then again personal monitoring and indirect approaches are also available like both skin prick test and the prevalence of mite specific antibodies are used to assess sensitization to mite uh, allergens in the individual. So, that allergy related test can be carried out. Well, these measures indicate that an individual has been exposed, but uh, do not give information on the degree of the exposure. So, that is a reliable approach in that sense. Indirect approach is there like samples of house dust are usually uh, collected uh, either onto a fiber or directly into a paper bag using a special vacuum cleaner. So, those, those kind of uh, you know indirect approaches are also available. Well, three types of method are available. Uh, for determining mite numbers or allergens, allergens means those kind uh, those causes aller allergic reactions. So, allergen levels in house dust and mite counts or uh, these um, you know immunochemical assays of mite allergens and uh, uh, you know related uh, determination of the quantities can be done. Then mite allergens can be quantified in house dust extracts by a number of uh, you know techniques and uh, those techniques are uh, you know already we have discussed like ELISA, ELISA. When we talk about ventilation rate related monitoring because they influence the exposure of a uh, of uh, those living in the indoor environment. So, the tracer gas uh, related decay technique can be used. So, by far the most commonly used method of estimating air exchange rates in the tracer gas decay technique is the most popular. In this method basically a tracer gas is released into the building space or one or uh, at one or more points possibly with the use of fans and in this way an attempt is made, made to produce a uniform concentration throughout the building space. So, that we can uh, see the decay rate uh, later on and the air exchange rate can be obtained from the slope of uh, you know and this uh, semi logarithmic plot of the natural logarithm of the pollutant concentration versus time kind of plots. So, the correlation can be established and then equilibrium concentration method is also used. In this method a tracer gas is released at a constant rate into the building spaces. Okay. In the steady state condition with the perfect mixing the indoor concentration will reach a steady state value. Okay. Then from this and the uh, this injection rate the infil infiltration rate can be calculated. With this technique although it is simple to perform it often takes many hours to reach a steady state equilibrium. So, it is time consuming basically. Well, then we also have devices for measuring mechanical ventilations and the methods commonly used for this is to estimate the ventilation rate uh, for systems that use uh, like uh, these recirculation and this include pressure measuring devices, velocity meters, mechanical gas flow indicators, tracer gas techniques and heat balance techniques. Okay. All these kind of instruments are used for these parameters. Then care must be you know taken to distinguish between the total rate at which air enters at a particular zone and the rate at which outside air enters the 
zone. So, those differentiation must be made otherwise there are chances of erroneous estimations. Well, then temperature measuring devices are also important because we need to measure temperature which also play role in indoor air quality, temperature and humidity. Humidity we will discuss, first we will discuss about the temperature measuring devices which are suitable for continuous monitoring include like uh, thermocouples or semiconductors and uh, these thermistors and typical indoor temperature ranges from 15 to 40 degree Celsius. So, that kind of range uh, this instrument should be uh, you know applicable for. Temperature gradients can be large in a building and even in the individual room. So, that gradient must be captured by the instrument. So, that kind of sensitivity must be there and the probes should be placed where they will sense the temperature experienced by the occupant. So, that realistic kind of measurements can be taken. When we talk about uh, measurement of relative humidity, the easiest way to measure indoor humidity level is by using a hygrometer and this hygrometer is a device that uh, you know serves as an indoor thermo uh, indoor thermometer and humidity monitor basically both things can be measured. Commercially available dew point hygrometers based on the principle that the uh, this uh, vapor pressure of water is decreased by the pressure of inorganic salt are well suited to continuous monitoring purposes. Relative humidity can be readily calculated from dry bulb and dew point temperature. So, these are well established methodologies, methodologies for measurement of relative humidity. So, in nutshell we can say that the principal process dealt with the uh, you know exposure assessment of indoor air pollution includes the measurements and evaluation of the pollutants into the micro environments of an occupant. Exposure measurements or estimates may be based on data related to uh, you know pollutant sources, environmental concentrations, personal exposure or contact uptake or intake of pollutants into the body, internal dose and biological tissues or uh, fluids. The exposure estimates always refer to a specific population. So, that uh, relationship we should keep in mind. In some cases, the actual exposure uh, cannot be measured. Instead, ex, uh, this exposure indicators are used such as presence of mold as an indicator of microbial exposure or the presence of gas appliances to indicate an increase in the nitrogen dioxide. So, uh, emission related uh, of those pollutants we have to see the situation and the temperature and humidity of indoor air are important uh, factors directly influencing the comfort and health of the occupants. They also influence you know the concentration of pollutants. So, this is all for today uh, you know related to uh, exposure assessment within the indoor micro environments. So, these are the references for your additional information. Thank you for kind attention. See you again in the next lecture. Thanks again.